Welcome everyone to uh, Chapel's online service. It's uh, great to have you with us. It's great to be with you wherever you are. We're glad you're joining us uh, for worship. Uh, we've been doing our services online for a number of weeks now because of all the restrictions and all that's going on with the pandemic. But I just want to let you know that we're super excited that things seem like they're going to be opening up in our Commonwealth. Uh, people are going back to work and churches have been allowed to uh, reopen, which it's kind of a misnomer. We haven't been closed. We've still been doing our work and and caring and shepherding people, but we've just been doing it online. And the heart of the church is to actually be together personally and relationally. And so we're targeting June 14th for uh, the reopening date. Now, just to let you know, there's lots of requirements and restrictions. And so we're trying to create the uh, best uh, worship environment where we can get, get back together and see each other and those kinds of things, but we're trying to create a safe environment as well. The stipulations and the things that we have to go through may at times seem a little too stringent, but it's, uh, it's part of uh, loving others more than you love yourself. Uh, the last thing I wanna do is have people come here and, and get sick and cause a loved one to, to maybe even pass away. And so uh, we're taking all the precautions, we're doing what the government says. As a result, our services are gonna be pretty small, uh, but just be thinking about joining us uh, we'd love to have you there. I, I created another video that goes through lots of details uh, related uh, to what it's going to be like, what the experience will be like, some of the requirements that we have to maintain. And uh, you can look at that. You can read our email for the details. But pray for us as we begin to transition uh, this way. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you guys soon. So again, glad you're here. Welcome. And uh, let's, uh, let's praise the Lord uh, with Jillian. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies And if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside Well, there's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain Well, he's a pain taker if you feel lost, well, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. Well, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, well, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, well, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a savior, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, chain breaker if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify if you believe it if you receive it come on if you can feel it somebody testify testify yeah if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you got pain, well, he's a pain taker. If you feel He's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, well, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, well, he's a chain breaker. 
Welcome everyone to another uh, Sunday service here at Chapel. We're glad to be with you and uh, hope you've had a, a good week. We've been studying uh, a sermon series out of the book of Daniel entitled uh, Control in the Midst of Chaos. It sort of fits all the wacky things that are happening in our society right now with the pandemic and it definitely fits the context of the nation of Israel in terms of scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, they were going through some crazy times too. Daniel and his three companions were uh, Jerusalem was sacked. They were exiled to the city of Babylon. They were trained in a new job, astrology and all those kinds of things. They were advisors to the king. I mean, everything in their whole world turned upside down. And one of the consistent things that we've been talking about over the last five weeks or so is that no matter what your circumstances look like, no matter how it might seem, God is in control. Uh, no matter how strange or hostile or different the world might appear to you, uh, that doesn't change the character and the nature of God. He loves you. Uh, he is in control of all things. He is in control of all history, all events, all creation. There's no one greater and bigger and more powerful uh, than him. The Old Testament calls him Yahweh. Uh, our Yahweh God is awesome. And so today we're going to be studying out of Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to be getting some practical advice, uh, just three things or so, uh, in terms of how to survive in a hostile world. Uh, when people are sort of against you and, and making demands that go against your Christian faith or your desire uh, to follow Jesus, how do, you, how do you survive that? And Daniel gives us some great advice in chapter six. Before I jump in, uh, let me pray. Father, thank you uh, for today. Thanks for the chance to um, just be together <clears throat> and to talk with you as one body that loves you and is enabled uh, to love you and to be family together through you, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus, you you lived, you died, you were resurrected from the dead. You're the one that makes us family and gives us forgiveness. And without you, we would have nothing. So thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done. Holy Spirit, speak to us now about how to live uh, in this uh, chaotic uh, world and show us how to be a good uh, representation of you because we're now no longer ourselves. We're a citizen of heaven, we're a child of yours. And we want to represent you well and stay faithful in our service and obedience to you. So thanks for giving us the Bible to explain these things. Teach us now. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe Daniel teaches us uh, how to stay faithful in a hostile world. And we'll study that in Daniel chapter 6. Before I get to that, though, just a quick history and reminder of where we're at. If you remember last week, uh, Babylon was sacked. King Belshazzar his life was taken after a big banquet that they had. And at that banquet, something really strange happened and a disembodied hand showed up and wrote on the wall uh, a message of his doom. He was measured, he was weighed, and he was found divided and wanting. He was found uh, unworthy and was judged and was killed. And so a big transition from the great powerful Babylon, uh, Belshazzar, the, the principal greatest king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, probably his grandfather, all that was transferred over to Persia, and specifically to Darius the Mede. Now, people for centuries, <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of years, have tried to discredit the Bible as inaccurate, and try to come up with the lack of archeological evidence and those kinds of things that would make the Bible untrustworthy. One of the problems that people have with Daniel chapter six is Babylon, Babylon doesn't, uh, in this area of the ancient world, <clears throat> and in the Persian records, it doesn't claim a king named Darius the Mede. He claims uh, that there's a Darius that was king, but he was actually two centuries, uh, two, two, two uh, time periods or two kings away uh, from Cyrus of Persia, the main king that represented the Persian kingdom. So uh, what most people think happened is uh, Cyrus and other kings set up this governance of decentralizing power and putting a satrap or a ruler in different cities around the world. Babylon tried to centralize power and, and suck it into this one city, uh, but uh, Persia was different, they decentralized. And so this Darius the Mede might have been the general that conquered the city of Babylon. He might have been uh, Cyrus's uh, uh, mitigating king for a period of time to rule the satrap to rule over this area. Regardless though, I believe just like in all cases that I've ever studied, uh, archeology span and history will one day uh, show us clearly uh, that this is an accurate record. And, uh, and there's great explanations as to who he is and why he was there. And so in point, Cyrus is in charge of the whole kingdom. This is his representative. And uh, one of the things uh, that he goes through in this journey of uh, 
of ruling in this new area, this new world for the Persian kingdom, is he, is he gets a lesson in humility. Uh, so one of the ways that I think we can survive in a hostile world, and I'll describe the hostility that was in this situation in Daniel chapter 6, and you can turn there and we'll, we'll read just a little bit. One of the ways you can survive this world, though, is, is to not, not be corrupt and to uh, basically uh, be good and obey God. So don't be corrupt. Don't make it worse for yourself as a Christian and announcing that you're a Christian and be uh, involved in negligent behavior and corruption and those kinds of things and, and be good and, and, and obey like, like Daniel. Let's pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6, verse uh, 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Remember, Daniel was always prospering, and, and most of the other astrologers and seers and, and voices and city officials, they hated that about him. They were jealous. So because of his exceptional qualities, the king planned to set him up over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct or government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God, with his religious beliefs, with believing that Yahweh was the only true God that exists. I don't know, know what it would be like to have no negligence or no corruption and to be known as, as, gosh, you know, we can't get this guy on anything unless we sort of manufacture evidence. They were jealous. They wanted to make him look bad. But he was such a distinguished, hard worker, good person uh, that there was nothing uh, that they could find uh, to corrupt his, his stance and, his, and, his, and how the king viewed him as influential and, 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 and helpful. So I guess what I'm saying is, is we don't want to give the world, the hostile world, ammunition to beat us up with. Uh, we need to be as good as possible. Now, goodness doesn't make God love us. Remember, he loves us by grace through Christ's death on the cross and his sacrificial death taking away our, our sin penalty that we deserve to pay. So I'm not saying we need to be perfect. Daniel wasn't perfect. But we need to make it very difficult for the world uh, to be extra hostile towards us. So, for example, at your particular job, like Daniel's job, there needs to be no negligence. You need to be known as the hardest worker that there is, uh, the, the least corrupt person uh, that's around, completely trustworthy in all things. And that means simple things like having a good attitude and showing up and being, being trustworthy and people can count on you and you do your job and you have a good work ethic and you have a good attitude. Those make it difficult for the hostile, those ideas and those character qualities make it difficult for a hostile world to give you a hard time. My dad used to say, whenever I would leave the house as a kid, he'd say, hey, be good, be good. It was my intention not to drag the Duncan family name uh, through the mud. I wanted to be as good as I, I could be. Again, not for acceptance of God, but because God has loved me and forgiven me, I wanted to represent him well. Uh, Daniel did that perfectly, and it was, and they had to find something that uh, was manufactured, something made up about his religion in order to get him in trouble. So I would just challenge you, how you doing in your job? How you doing in this area of not being corrupt? Uh, it's not going to fix or solve the problem of a hostile world that doesn't believe in God and Jesus Christ like we do. Uh, but if your behavior doesn't match what you say, uh, it makes it worse. All the world loves a hypocrite, loves a Christian that shoots his mouth off about something, says he's a Christian, and then acts the opposite. Uh, we need to be servants and loving people and kind and, and be on our best behavior at our jobs and in public spaces and those kinds of things, because that's what sets us uh, apart as being holy and different and those kinds of things. So one way to handle hostility is to not give the enemy ammunition, the world ammunition, to bring you down and to say bad things uh, against you. Another thing you can do is, is not worry, just talk to God. Uh, don't fret and worry, just talk to God about this. So basically what, what's happening in this particular hostility and this, this crisis is these jealous uh, rulers and leaders and seers and sorcerers, they come to the king and they, they play to his ego. Uh, he's probably struggling with vanity, he's just conquered this great historic city. And they say, hey, look, 
what you should do is you should sign a decree in law saying that you and only you are deity and should be worshiped as a God for 30 days. Now, when I think about this, it's a little bit crazy. So if I, if I was going to sign something into law that I was a God and you couldn't worship any other God besides me, I, I don't know, I'd probably do it more than 30 days. I mean, why, why 30 days? No one really knows, but maybe it was a test of loyalty uh, to this new founded kingdom in Persia, Persia coming in. Uh, but basically this guy signed something into law that it's illegal and you could be killed if you worship any other God, any other deity besides him as king. And one of the weird things about uh, the law of Darius or the law of the Medes and the Persians was as they had a rule that once you signed something into law, it had to, it had to be fulfilled. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't change it. So basically, uh, people got trapped. The king's authority was even trapped with himself. He, he liked Daniel. He wanted him to be an important part of his kingdom rule. But once he signed this law and Daniel didn't obey, right, uh, he had no choice but to follow through and, uh, and punish Daniel and try to, uh, try to help him follow this, this law. So I'm in verse uh, 10, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Let's pick up the story there. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, that he couldn't worship his own one true God, he had to worship the king, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree, this law that he established. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or man except you, O king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed or broken. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king or to the decree you're put in writing, they're playing to his ego, right? He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. So basically you got a guy here that's probably vain and insecure, bought into this crazy idea to be God for 30 days, but he really is regretting it. But he's cast this law and this law cannot be broken. What was Daniel's response? Remember I said earlier, one way to handle hostility against you is not to worry and not to fret. You don't see Daniel here panicking or setting out a, setting out a plea for help or rallying the troops and protesting and doing all kinds of crazy things. He does what he's always done, which he goes to the upper room, uh, opens his windows, so he's not hiding and he's hiding, he can be seen, and he prays towards Jerusalem, a sense of hope and future that one day they might be restored a place where God could again be worshiped in the temple and those kinds of things. And so he's calm. He just talks to God and prays. And, and it says here, he asks for his help. I don't know why I struggle sometimes with uh, asking for help. I'm a better helper than a helpee. And sometimes the way my brain works is I can easily worry and fret so much that I catastrophize things. It's a word that I use to, to talk about my train of thought. For example, I was trying to fix, let's fix the uh, tricycle of my three-year-old grandson, Chase. Somehow he rode it and came back with the wheel and the handlebars and the back wheels just all separated. Something broke. So I got together some bolts and screws and then I was working on it. But the process was incredibly maddening because he wanted to help which I didn't mind, but he kept taking the screws and throwing them places and putting things in the wrong place and taking apart or moving apart that I said, don't touch this. Of course he touches it and bends it around. And I got to thinking while I was sitting there, if this kid doesn't let me fix this bike for him, it's gonna be traumatic, okay? So he's not gonna learn how to ride a bike. And then my brain spins and I'm like, well, you know, and he's probably gonna struggle uh, making friends because friends like people that can ride bikes. And then when he doesn't make friends, he's probably going to be isolated at school and, and, and not do well in his studies. And when he doesn't do well in his studies, he's going to get around the, the creepy, yucky kids that are smoking weed. And he's probably going to end up getting addicted to weed. And then he probably won't uh, maybe graduate. And then after that, he, no one will want to marry him and he probably won't be married. And I know, believe me, I know all that I just said sounds crazy, but if I don't interrupt this catastrophizing, 
by sanely asking God <laughs> to stop my emotions. Uh, I spin out of control and I worry and I waste energy needlessly, right? Daniel didn't do anything like that. His reflex, his first reflex was to pray and ask for God's help. That is not always my first reflex. I problem solve. I, 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 I think about things. I create anxieties. I create scenarios that may not ever, ever happen. And how much better would my life be in a hostile world uh, that's against a lot of the things that you and I believe if I just prayed more often and I asked humbly for God's help? I love the comparison between God and his law and his rule and the law of the Medes and Persians. You see, the law that Darius had actually enslaved him. He couldn't even change the thing, even though he liked Daniel. But God's law is perfect. God's law is, is, is humbling and adequate to forgive us of our sins through his son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. God's law is, is, is freeing and full of grace and love and compassion. Human laws are not like that. But whenever we run into a situation that's a crisis, just like Daniel, we'd be better off if we just uh, kind of turned our eyes to Jerusalem, so to speak. We prayed. We humbly asked for his help. This was a habit. He was used to doing this three times a day. He didn't change anything. Uh, he just kept to his routine and obeyed and worshiped God because that's all he could do. And that's what God expects us to do is to obey uh, no matter how hostile things might get. The story continues uh, where Daniel is, uh, by the decree, by the law that was signed, he's thrown into a lion's den. Now, historically, there's not a lot of evidence of uh, people being thrown into a pit of lions. I mean, there are a couple. Typically, what they would do, though, was a test of uh, water, like a water ordeal or a test where they would they'd basically just throw you in the water and sink you down. And if, and if you didn't drown, if you lived... Um, kind of similar to some of the Salem witch trials here in Massachusetts and those kind of things. If you lived, you were okay. If you died, you were a witch, you were a bad person and those kinds of things. So those kinds of acts were uh, common, but it's fascinating to see what happens in this situation. The king is so distraught. He doesn't sleep uh, the night that Daniel's in the lion's pit. They put a big rock to seal it and he sealed it with a signet ring so nobody could mess with it. Uh, these lions were vicious and hungry. And so he spent the night there. The next morning, though uh, we find out what God has done to show his greatness. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 19. At first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God. I love that description. It's not just a God that exists and is true, but it's a God that is actively involved in the lives of people, the lives of his creation. He recognizes that Daniel worships a living God, whether he totally understands him or not. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel spoke up and answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king, I've served you faithfully. I've been honest. I haven't been negligent in my duties. I've worked hard. I've always been up front and told you the truth, those kinds of things. The king at this point was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. And just to sort of show you how dangerous the situation was and how great God is, they were thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor, before they even their bodies even hit the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. Kind of weirds me out a little bit thinking about being mauled by, by a lion. I don't really think about that. I think about maybe being mauled by an ape. I got a thing that I just, apes freak me out. But either way, it'd just be terrible. Uh, be a really, really yucky way uh, to go. And then after this, Darius goes on to praise the living God. He's the living God. His kingdom will reign forever. He rescues and saves. He performs all these miraculous signs. So basically, God has made it clear uh, that uh, he is God. So that's the last little idea I want to give you. Don't protest or demand for God's rescue. Just trust him. So when you, when you hear this story, do you hear 
uh, Daniel begging the king for his life? You don't. Do you hear Daniel uh, uh, saying, look, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a revolution. I'm going to gather an army about this evil king, Darius the Mede, and, and this is wrong. We should all be able to worship who we want to worship and those kinds of things. You don't hear any of that evil either. You find this humble uh, person, Daniel, quietly obeying, quietly praying, deciding not to worry, and then not even bothering about asking for a rescue, just trusting God that whatever happens, happens. And God is still good, and He still loves him. I find it fascinating when I think about Daniel in this situation, and a lot of people use this chapter of Scripture to justify sort of civil disobedience against governments and authorities and powers. And I'm not saying that there isn't uh, justification for standing up against God. In fact, standing up against the governments that ask us to do things that are against our faith. Uh, in fact, Acts 5.29, Peter, the, the establishment had gotten in trouble. Peter had gotten in trouble by, by talking about Jesus, and they asked him to stop. And Peter said, I can't not obey you. I have to obey God. I, I have to talk about what I've seen and heard about Jesus Christ. So there are certain instances where we need to stand up and fight for the things that are true. Uh, but I don't believe it's justified particularly in this chapter of Scripture. You don't see protests. You don't see fighting. You don't see him enlisting an army or signing petitions and those kinds of things. You see him quietly trusting God, whether he gets rescued or not, and using this situation to bring glory to God. So I think more in Scripture what you see is God saying, you don't really need rescue. What I need you to do is be faithful in the hard times. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily make your life easy, but I'll use the things that the broken world throws at you and the suffering and that kind of stuff. I'll use that to give you opportunities to testify about the greatness of God and maybe even influence a, a non-Christian like Darius to testify about the greatness of God by, by the miraculous things uh, that he does. Uh, what are, you might ask, certain times where we need to fight and obey God rather than man? Well, a few come to mind, like if I was told by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which I love, I love this state, I love living here, that I was not able, I was not allowed to preach uh, the Bible anymore, I would, I would fight that with my, with my life. If I was told that I couldn't talk with people about Jesus Christ anymore and, and I couldn't proclaim that He is the absolute only way to have a relationship with God, all other things are false and not true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no salvation except under Him. If I was not allowed to say that, I would fight and, and gladly give my life. You see, most of the time in Scripture, God doesn't ask us to fight or, or doesn't ask us to, to beg for mercy or rescue. He asks us to be willing to die uh, for God, to be willing to give our lives to the things that we believe as we serve and as we love people. So by and large, I'm a, I'm a fan of America and our government. Uh, and I and I don't and I'm not a big conspiracy guy. I don't think people are out to get us necessarily, but there are a few things that I would fight for. But they're very they're very few. Otherwise, I try to be a good citizen. I, I try to obey the law. I try to wear a mask, not just for my own safety. And you, I told you I hate wearing masks. It just makes me feel like I'm like I'm choking and, and stuff like. That. I just don't like how it feels. But I do it because it's a good thing to protect you. And I care more about you than I do about how I might feel about things and those kinds of things. So that's by and large how God wants us to live. So again, just a quick review. If you're living in a hostile world and, and the government or somebody is telling you to do things that are against your faith, what should you do? We talked about you should uh, live a, a life to not give give them more ammunition to, to make your life miserable or, or to defame or disgrace or disparage the life of Jesus Christ who, who you proclaim to love. You should not worry, but but talk to God and ask for his help and pray. Uh, as a reflex, as a first thing. And then you shouldn't get caught up all the time with asking for rescue. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I pray for rescue and healing uh, for, for everybody. For many people, I, I, I ask God for what I want to ask Him for. He says I can approach the throne of grace with confidence in, in the book of Hebrews and talk to Him about what I want to talk to Him about. So I ask, but I don't demand. And I'm willing to die in the hard circumstance that I'm in and stay faithful so that God will get the glory uh, for my life and, and not me or a church or, or anything else. So how do you apply this uh, to your life? A couple of thoughts here. Number one, how can you make prayer your first response rather than worrying or problem solving on your own? 
how do you make prayer that reflex muscle uh, when you're in crisis or when you're worried or when you're catastrophizing like I do? Think about it. Ask God to sort of get your attention through his spirit. Uh, maybe uh, one of the things that I do to start my prayer life and to help my prayer life as I read the Psalms and the Psalms sort of center my, my ADD brain and allow me to, to concentrate on what God would have me pray about rather than my own agenda. And that sort of helps me. Whatever it is, ask God to help you um, be more prayer oriented than effort and work and self-sufficient oriented. The next thing is, is what things in obedience to God sort of rise to that level of civil disobedience? What what do you think, and maybe discuss this with your family and your friends uh, and your children, what rises to that level of defiance and I want to obey God like Peter did? He was commanded not to talk about Jesus Christ. He says, I can't do that. That's what God wants me to do. What rises to that level and how should your response be uh, to our government, to possible times of hostility and misunderstanding about who we are and what we believe? This is something really good to think about and ask God to give you wisdom. If you're here today and, and uh, this is sort of the first time you're joining us or perhaps you've been joining in for a little while and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I'd ask you to consider putting your faith and trust in Him, His life, His death on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins that you and I deserve to pay and His resurrection to prove that He's God. I'd ask you just to talk to Him like Daniel did and, and just say, help me. Help me understand who you are, Jesus. Help me grow. Help me understand the Bible. I'm tired of living in fear and anxiety the way that I have been living, and I need you. If you know Jesus like many of us do and you have that relationship, uh, let's rejoice that he's in control. Let's rejoice uh, that he gives us helpful tips in Scripture. Even the Old Testament, a story 2,600 years old that has practical advice of prayer and not worrying and be willing to die rather than demanding rescue, those kinds of things. Those are great life lessons and how to deal with hostility and that kind of stuff. So let's rejoice that he loves us. And again, I uh, just want to uh, pray for us. We're going to celebrate here at communion here in a little bit. Josh King, our student director, will lead us uh, through that. But let me, let me pray. Father, thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for the practical teaching and equipping that we get through the Bible. Father, thank you that we live in such a free country where this even being civil disobedient uh, about certain things rarely happens uh, because we were given such freedom here. There's many parts of the world that aren't that free, Lord, and people suffer and are tortured and are dying for their faith. And I pray that you'd be with them in a special way. Give them mercy and hope and their families. They're believing in the truth, but they're, but they're being treated terribly. Um, please uh, rescue them. And if not, Rescue, be merciful, and use their lives to bring glory to your name so that more people could put their faith and trust in you, Jesus. Give us uh, wisdom as we lead. Give us the ability uh, to plan how to gather back together as a church as we seem to be opening up things as a country. Keep us healthy and show us uh, how to live, Jesus, and may we equip as many people as possible to know you and to follow you, and may we follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will be transitioning to a time of communion now. Also, we as a church are transitioning from 100% online services uh, to in-person services with live streaming available. Information about all this went out this past week, and we will be sending out more information about the reopening in the next few days. One thing we wanted to mention, though, as a staff, uh, we are still working through details on how to take in-person communion uh, safely. Honestly, it might be a few weeks until we have all those details ironed out. Uh, so this might be the last time we're able to take communion together for a little bit of time. With this in mind, I wanted to just remind everyone that while communion is really important, uh, it is not what saves us. It's not like if we miss a communion for a week or two that Jesus might not forgive us during those one or two weeks. It's not like uh, when we get to heaven, <laughs> Jesus is going to be like, well, you missed communion that one or two weeks, so you have to do 100 laps or 100 push-ups or anything like that. Our relationship with God is based upon grace and faith. I love Ephesians 2.8. Uh, it's really helpful at a time like this. It says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. I love that. It's not from ourselves. It's not, it's not something that we do. We rely on God choosing us and forgiving us and knowing all of the details about our life even before we do. Now, this includes this crazy pandemic season and all those details that we'll be sorting out. 
Uh, so with all that in mind, uh, let's pray together uh, and take communion. Uh, this is going to be from Mark chapter 14. Jesus, we do thank you for communion and thank you uh, for how important it is. Uh, but thank you that the, the cross is even more important. <laughs> our faith and our forgiveness is based upon the cross and based upon Jesus, uh, not about something that we do like taking communion. But we do want to obey you, and we thank you that the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. Uh, may this serve as a reminder of your word and our relationship with you. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus, again, thank you for communion, uh, and thank you for the cross. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for you know, making the ultimate sacrifice. I pray that you remind us, this in, remind us in a special way um, that we are still a church, even though we're going through uh, this crazy season and things are changing, it seems like, week to week. I pray that you remind us that you never change and help us just rely upon you more. And may we be closer to you at the end of it all. In your name, amen. This final song that we're going to do today is a song that I grew up listening to and singing at a small church uh, that I grew up in. And it's just been on... It's on, it's been on my mind since this whole series on Daniel. And um, so let's let's sing it together this morning. Fear not, for I am with you, fear not. For I am with you, fear not. For I am with you, says the Lord. Oh, fear not, for I am with you, fear not. For I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. For I have redeemed you and I've called you my name, child, you are mine. When you walk through the waters, I will be there, and through the flames, you will not no way be drowned, you will not no be burned for I am with you oh, oh, oh. fear not for I am with you fear not for I am with you fear not for I am with you says the Lord oh fear not for I am with you fear not for I am with you, fear not. For I am with you, says the Lord. For I have redeemed you and I've called you my name. Child, you are mine. When you walk through the waters, I will be there. And through the flames, you will not, no way, be drowned. You will not, no way. For I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Well, that's it for us uh, for today's service. Again, glad you joined us. Been praying for you guys a lot. Looking forward to seeing many of you in, in a couple of weeks, uh, God willing. And uh, just uh, I pray uh, that you have a good week, another week with your family and that things are going okay and that you're healthy and you're rejoicing in the Lord, even though a pandemic can be a pretty hostile environment. Uh, you're, doing, you're doing okay and hanging in there. So let me pray for you and bless you out. Father, thank you uh, for your life 
for your death, the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for going through so much so many years ago that allows us to have forgiveness and hope and peace and comfort. Thanks for the Bible that gives us such great stories, true stories that are grounded in history and grounded in hope for people in exile and, and people that struggle like we do. Father, would you, uh, would you give us a good, uh, a good weekend? Would you give us a good new week of life? Help us uh, follow you and be willing to uh, not worry, but pray instead and, and be willing to not demand rescue or change, but trust you with what's going on in our lives and, and serve and, and die to ourselves as we go through circumstances. Uh, more than anything, may you get glory out of our lives, Lord, and out of this church, Chapel of the Cross, uh, for your name, Jesus. We lift your name up higher uh, than anyone else, and we ask that people would know you, that we could equip them to know you and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Uh, talk to you later. This is Josh King, the Director of Student Ministries here at Chapel. Thank you for joining us this morning for Chapel's online worship service. We are excited to gather in person starting June 14th. We will have two services available, one at 9.30 a.m. and the other at 11.30 a.m. The 9.30 service will be live streamed on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash chapelcares. Please check your email or the church's website for more information. Be sure to stay connected with us. We have programs available for all ages. As soon as this worship service concludes, we have offerings for Chapel Kids, toddlers up through fifth grade. Email tanya at chapelcares.com for more information and for the Zoom invites. We will be having refuel today at 4.30 p.m. This is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And after this Sunday, refuel will be taking a little break as the students are finishing up school and as we plan for meeting in person. Contact me, Josh King, if you would like to find out more. Josh at chapelcares.com. Chapel has several adult life groups that are continuing to meet online. Life groups offer the relationship and support that God has in mind for you. We have a variety of life groups, some geared to certain stages of life, such as college and career or married couples. Other groups are mixed demographics. Contact Pastor Derek and he can help you decide which group is the best fit for you. His email is derek at chapelcares.com. Thank you again for joining us this morning. For a complete list of our online programs, please visit our website, chapelcares.com. Also be sure to follow us on social media. We are Chapel Cares on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you for supporting Chapel of the Cross with your help. We are able to offer so many online programs as well as outreach programs supporting our greater community. If you would like to support Chapel, you can give online or through the mail. And please come back next week as we continue our online series going through the book of Daniel.